Okay, tradition. Our Barranquilla, I should have practiced that, chapter chose this month's exploration of tradition, and Andre Monhar Felf illustrated the theme. So every month, one of our chapters picks the theme and does the illustration. I love this one. So tradition. Traditions are sacred because they cultivate consistency and a sense of belonging. It's the bread and butter for fostering connection and community. We are in a time where traditions are being challenged and remixed. We question how they came to be and the context and how or if they fit into the future. This is just the way it is as a statement of fear, not possibility. It undermines the human capacity to adapt and create change. Traditions are made by us for us, so therefore they can be reinvented with intention and imagination. You may not start the next national holiday, but you can bring to the table your generosity, your kindness, your vision, and heart to create a more welcoming future. So this month, it is our tradition to do what we call Audience Takes the Stage. So a couple months ago, we put out a call for applicants, and we have three brave souls who will be up here speaking today. We have Megan Morgan, well this is not in the correct order, but Megan Morgan, Jen Sung, Marco Gizar, and I'm really excited to have them. First we have Jen Sung. She's the daughter of Chinese immigrants and grew up in a small town in New Jersey. And has been on the hunt for extraordinary, extraordinary stories for as long as she can remember. Her work has appeared in Red Book, The Manifestation, and Entropy. Her memoir in progress, Beautiful Tomorrows, is a coming of age story about depression, family, and the silences we learn to break. Her spirit animal is the hummingbird, who can traverse great distances despite being small. Please help me welcoming Jen, welcome Jen to the stage. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. This is my first time at Creative Morning Sacramento. I, thank you. <laughs> I moved to California this summer with my family. I used to be a regular at Creative Mornings in Atlanta, where I lived for 14 years, but didn't pick up a southern drawl. I really love connecting with other creatives, so I'm excited to be here. I want to tell you a story about tradition. Well, actually, about a tradition I thought I had lost. In Chinese families, there's a tradition when naming a child that's passed on for generations. Let me explain. A name consists of three Chinese words. The first position is the surname. The second is determined according to tradition. And the third is chosen by the parents. For the second position, every family keeps a book of names usually in a sacred place that lists the designated name for each generation, and this list can cycle every 16 or 32 generations. So my, my Chinese name is Song Wen Mei. And so my cousins on my father's side share the same middle word, Wen, which means literature or culture. For most of my life, I believed I had been named based on this tradition. I'm an only child, and my parents are immigrants born in mainland China. They fled to Taiwan with their families after the Communist Revolution in 1949. My parents didn't talk a lot about their harrowing journeys before arriving in America. I picked up bits and pieces about our family history and took comfort in the fact I could tell people my name is based on this family tradition. Like other American-born Chinese, or ABCs, I knew growing up in New Jersey, I studied hard, played piano, and went to Chinese school on Saturdays. Sometime during elementary school, I started responding to my parents in English instead of Mandarin, and tried my hardest to be an all-American kid, blasting my boombox in my bedroom, and lip-syncing to Madonna or Bon Jovi, a time-honored tradition of growing up in the 80s. In my 20s, I married a great guy, Irish Catholic, with his own traditions, and we now have two kids. 
I carry a lot of guilt about not passing on more Chinese traditions to my children beyond occasionally eating dim sum or giving out red envelopes for Chinese New Year. Ten years ago, when I was pregnant with my son, I wanted to give him a Chinese name. So I asked my dad about our family book of names. He told me again it's usually kept in a temple in a family's village. This time, he went on to say, nothing was saved from ours after the war, and there were no records. I didn't believe him. No, you told me about this tradition, I insisted. He said, it is tradition, just not ours. When I reminded him, my cousins and I share the same middle word, he said his father had picked out a word. <laughs> there is no book to consult. <laughs> his words hit me hard. It felt like plucking at random to me. I felt betrayed, like my naming tradition was a lie, and whatever tenuous thread I had to my ancestors was severed. As a parent, I have a lot of questions about tradition in my family history, ones that I've only started asking after my father underwent a major surgery three winters ago at age 84. He's in good health now, so whenever I visit him in New Jersey, I film his stories. I guess I am trying to make up for lost time. Perhaps surviving a life-threatening surgery changed him because now he has opened up when talking about the past. Last spring, we took the ferry to Manhattan and went to the Museum of Chinese in America, MOCA. In a room made to look like an old apothecary, my dad, an engineer who likes things to be precise, told the docent about how the abacus in the display was upside down and the curator should correct it. <laughs> he also talked about how he took an ore bearing freight ship to this country that took 31 days to get to port in Oakland, California. He recalled his first impression with a group of Chinese travelers arriving at San Francisco Bay at night. All the lights were still on in the buildings, he said. We couldn't believe it and said, I, uh, what a waste of electricity. <laughs> Later that evening, my dad said he had something important to show me. He went to his garage and came back triumphantly carrying a stack of five hardbound books. They had lipstick red covers with Chinese characters inscribed in gold on the front. Our last name, Song, caught the light. These are the book of names, he said. They are your ancestors. You can have them. <laughs> I was stunned into silence. How is this possible? I thought any trace of the past had been wiped out after the war. Had he forgotten about them and they spent the last 30 years or longer buried in boxes in his garage? I was so elated by the discovery, I didn't probe more about why he said they didn't exist anymore. We flipped the pages, organized by location, looking for the name of his father's village in Guizhou, a southwestern province of China. Each section follows the male heirs, and the lineage is clearly designated with number one son, number two son, and so on. In the past, daughters went unnamed. They are listed as wives by last name only in their husband's books, but not in their own family's books. The names date back to 200 BC. That's a whole lot of songs, I joked. <laughs> yes, it is, he replied with gravity. It turns out my dad's dad, my grandfather, when he was in his 70s, had hired someone to track down and copy these precious pages of names. The generations are numbered and go up to 136. There was something reassuring about seeing all of these names. After studying different volumes and flipping the yellowing pages, my dad stopped and looked up surprised. Look, here's your name, he said, pointing with his finger and turning the page to face me. I took the book from him, feeling the weight of it in my hands. Amidst all of these thousands of names, there was mine, Song Wen Mei. The connection felt more concrete than anything I'd ever experienced before. I let out a sigh of relief. I could finally lay claim to my place in our lineage and embrace a family tradition that once again belongs to me.
Thank you. Thank you. You're done. Yay. Uh, <laughs> Next up, we have Megan Morgan. Megan is a writer, artist, yoga teacher, and mom. Born in Bermuda but raised in Canada, she moved to Sacramento five years ago to pursue a lifelong dream of living in California. Megan is dedicated to living a life of fulfillment and joy and helping others do the same. Her first book, an autobiographical account of three life-altering events called The End of Me, will be released in early 2019. Exciting. Okay, please help me welcome Megan. sitting in your seats last year. <laughs> so it's an exciting um, transition to being up here today. So thank you so much. And as Rebecca said, five years ago, um, this past fall, my family and I decided to move here to Sacramento. And this was our family then, and all of our family and friends back there kind of looked at us and tried to keep their eyebrows in line and not freak out after 13 years of living in the same house in the same town. We lived my whole life in Canada. Um, why would we want to leave universal health care, first of all, <laughs> and then move to a different country and start all over again? And uh, people respond to change differently. And my family kept talking about tradition and all the things I was going to be leaving behind. And I did a little more searching and discovered that our family's tradition is actually about change. And it's actually about embracing creativity. Um, and they didn't really realize that until I decided to leave. And so I wanted to go back a little bit and trace where this lineage comes from and how I'm pretty following, I'm following pretty closely the tradition in my family of picking up and moving on. And this is my mom, Ria, in the 1970s. And she was born in Belgium, um, but emigrated to Canada when she was three years old. And when she graduated high school, it wasn't really a great thing for women to go to college at that time, at least not in our family. So she decided to work for a few years, save up some money, and go traveling. So they weren't very excited about that either. <laughs> Scandalous for a woman in the 60s to travel alone. So her and her best friend saved up. And when they went to Bermuda on vacation, my mom met my dad. And she decided to stay there. And then she found out she was pregnant with me. And then they found out that my father was black. And they weren't very excited about that either. And the worst part for them, though, came uh, was six months after I was born, uh, my mom was killed in a horrific accident uh, by a driver under the influence. And my father never quite recovered from that incident. He became pretty depressed. Um, he certainly wasn't able to take care of me by himself. And when my grandmother, Madeline, my mother's mother, came from Canada, um, when all this was happening and she picked me up for the first time and apparently I'd been crying for three days after my mom had died and so she picked me up, put me on her shoulder and I instantly fell asleep and my dad was like, can you just take her for a little bit back to Canada until I can figure out what's going on with my life and so they agreed and so it seems then from the start I really didn't have a very traditional family set up and moved to Canada with my grandparents, Madeline and Ron. Ironically, both my dad's names are Ron. Um, so that confuses everybody. Um, but my father, my biological father, Ron, there in the background on the left, would come up traditionally twice a year at Christmas time and then summer vacation. And I had no idea who he was. He was like this ghostly figure. He was super tall. And he would sort of sit and smoke and have a drink. I don't remember the sound of his voice. Um, and so I called him Uncle Daddy, because every, everybody would tell me he was my dad, but we had a relationship kind of like an uncle that you would see a few times a year, so I called him Uncle Daddy. Um, and yeah, it, was, it took a while to navigate that relationship with him. We didn't have much time, because when I was four, um, after a visit to see me at um, summer vacation, he died of a heart attack at the Toronto International Airport. And from that point on, my grandparents here on the left formally adopted me. So I spent the rest of my life, until five years ago, growing up in Canada, 
Then I went back a little bit further again. And so my grandmother, Madeline here on the left, she left Belgium in 1952, pregnant with my uncle and my mom and my sister were two and one years old and just, you know, picked up and moved to Canada to start a new life. Um, she was one of the people most affected by our decision to move here. So I kind of found it ironic um, how much that affected her. She's still alive, she's 92, living in Canada. Um, and then her mother, Flavia, that's pictured just at the start of World War II in France, where she was living at the time. She too got in a boat on the in the 1970s and emigrated to Canada. And even though I lost both my biological parents, I was so blessed when I think about it now. I've grown up with my parents and, or my grandparents and my great grandparents all in the same household. And that was like weird <laughs> to my school friends. That didn't happen anywhere else. Um, and so I joked that I was the literal black sheep of my family, <laughs> like my whole life. And first day at school, like when I was introducing my parents and everybody would just stare at them and stare at me. Um, but the thing that was constant was change. Like long before HGTV, reality television, my grandparents here on the left we're flipping houses. So in the 70s and the 80s, we'd buy a house, live there for three years, fix it all up, move on. So when this became a thing on television, my grandma was like, why were we never on television for that stuff? <laughs> because that's just how we lived, and it was constant change. And so then I switched gears, started looking into my father's family that I don't know a lot about. I can't trace further back than my father's parents. So I was born in Bermuda, which everybody thinks is in the Caribbean. It's not. It's 300 miles east of South Carolina. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere, halfway between New York and England. Um, and it's actually a chain of small islands. It's 22 little islands. And it was discovered in 1605. And because it was so small and uninhabitable, no one moved there for 100 years. But eventually it became a colony. And I did some digging. So the last name I was born with as a baby that I got from my black father is Painter, P-A-Y-N-T-E-R. And I looked through ship manifests. And sometime in the 1800s, there's a woman named Mary who was white. They would list people's races when you got off the ship. Um, and she had moved there from England to Bermuda. So I thought it was ironic that my name comes from all these places. But I was really interested in finding out more. So I did a DNA test and found out that it's much more complicated than black and white. And I was so excited. The little map here, it's maybe hard to see in the whole room. So all the areas in white are the places where I don't have um, DNA from. But everywhere else, all the color. So I was like, I am a true citizen of the world. And that made me like so happy to know that there is all, these this, all this ancestry from everywhere and everything. But traditionally, you know, we're usually raised in one culture, maybe two, um, and we identify strongly as Italian-American or Portuguese-American or something American, something Canadian. So what if you found out this wasn't what you expected? I was happy about this, but what if you were not? And so I found this Twitter feed on Thanksgiving weekend where this woman's uncle on her Italian side <laughs> found out he had no Italian DNA whatsoever. And the whole, <laughs> the whole family was having a like, nervous breakdown and it like, destroyed all their concepts of themselves. <laughs> Why did you do that? So, <laughs> wait, I'll let you finish reading. <laughs> she ended up changing the name on her Twitter account because she got so many followers and retweets, it was like insane. So I think she tried to hide. Um, and then to bring this into the now, this is a photograph of one of my daughters. We have two daughters who are now 18 and 21. One of them's here today. Um, and so the one who can't be here today, of course, <laughs> she made a decision at 19 to travel by herself to Australia and New Zealand and go backpacking with friends up and down the coast. And I almost had a nervous breakdown. I was like, <laughs> what are you doing? You can't do this. But she saved up. She did it herself. She paid for it herself. Um, and I thought, of course, in her first term away at school, she moved to New York City, clear across the other side of the country, and I cried every day for like three weeks. Um, but you know, of course, this is her lineage, this is the tradition of leaving, of changing, and forging a path for yourself. 
Um, and so one thing I wanted to share with you to come back to the naming thing, and I'm so glad it ties in with what Jen was talking about as well. So I was born with the last name Painter. When I was adopted, I got the last name Dodds. And when I got married, I wholly embraced my husband's last name of Morgan, because I'm like, I'm choosing this. This is like my choice, and I'm choosing this guy. And a lot of women don't do that these days for professional and other reasons that I totally support. Um, but another little known fact is that I actually asked him to marry me, and I had a ring. <laughs> Um, so very, very untraditional proposal, but uh, traditional that I took the last name, but then we eloped and didn't tell anyone and pissed everybody off, so <laughs> that was kind of fun. Um, <laughs> and then how I kind of wrap all this up is I wanted to bring in a little bit about something I'm really passionate about as a yoga teacher and practitioner and the notion of death, because we're not supposed to talk about death, or in very low tones. Um, so I wrote a book about death called The End of Me. Um, and what it's about is essentially I have physically died three times in my life, when I was 19, when I was 24, and when I was 28. And one of the things that I came back with or that it's taught me is about living your life is about en embracing change and finding your own traditions, leaving behind the ones that don't serve you or your family anymore, not inviting toxicity to sit at your dinner table if that doesn't work for you, finding the traditions that work. Um, and this time of year brings up all this turmoil for people about the shoulds, right? What you should do, where you should go, what you should buy, what you should eat, like all these things um, come into play. And so this intensely personal story that I'm sharing with you is because I believe in the power and the tradition of storytelling. And here at Creative Mornings, this is something I've experienced every month for the last year. And I think by telling our stories, we give others permission to tell their stories too. And that's how we foster human connection. And that's how we make life worth living. And I think that's a tradition to keep going with. So thank you for letting me share my story today. Thank you, Megan. Now you're done. Okay, we got one more. Oops, speaker slides. Okay, Marco Gizar. Marco has a heavy background in team building and entrepreneurship. As a Marine Corps entry in infantryman, I said that right, he leads teams in the most stressful environments. I'm sorry, he led teams in the most stressful environments in both Iraq and Afghanistan. After the Marines, Marco knew he wanted to build a business where he could help people improve their overall physical and mental well being, and thus fit some which stands for FIT State of Mind, was born in 2011. Fitzem, Fitzem is a modern wellness studio based in Sacramento. It's right in Curtis Park, and they specialize in nervous system health. Please help me in welcoming Marco to the stage. I'm really excited to hear his story today. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? My name is Marco Gizar, and first and foremost, I wanted to thank everybody for showing up today and supporting Creative Morning. Rebecca and the whole team, I think, does, does, does a, a wonderful job for this community. Uh, my story starts in actually Calusa County. So I was born and raised in the country, and so uh, Calusa County is in between uh, uh, Woodland and Red Bluff. So we like to say that, uh, we say Ammons. We say, uh, we say Ammons. So, <laughs> We say M is because when we, when we shake the tree, we knock the L out of them. So I don't know, I just like to, I like to throw that out there. So my story starts back in 2001. I used to, before all this technology, I used to use my radio as my alarm clock. On this particular morning, it was Davy D, 102.5, and he's going nuts. He's talking about, this can't be a mistake, we're under attack. The second plane had just hit the World Trade Center. I'm kind of waking up and kind of get my wits about me, get dressed, go to school. Mr. Green, is, uh, my first class is Mr. Green and he's as angry as any patriot could be on that morning. And so I remember this like it was yesterday. I'm 30, 33 now and um, I'm 16 at the time. And I lean back in my chair and I'm just like, man, I guess I'm going to war. 
and that was the moment that I decided to join the United States Marine Corps. Um, I think I watched one too many Rambo movies or <laughs> what was going on back then, but you know, here I was, I was 16, so I couldn't join quite yet. I had to wait until I was 17. So next year came about and I talked my mom into signing the paperwork and here we go. Fast forward to my story, I went to boot camp. Boot camp was everything that boot camp should have been, it was tough. Fast forward to my story, I'm in the School of Infantry, it was actually a really tough school. I didn't really expect it to be that tough, so. But we got through it. Um, dropped into my unit, 1-3 uh, Weapons Company, 81's platoon, so I was actually stationed in Hawaii, so I thought that was not too shabby. Out in um, Kaneohe Bay, right next to Kailua, so that was very nice. Um, so let's go, here we go, we're in Okinawa, Japan, we have a big battalion commander's meeting kind of like this, and uh, he gets up to the microphone and he says, gents, we're going to war. And we all, we're, we're young, we're 19 at the time, we're, we're high-fiving, we're really excited about this, we didn't really know any better. So here we go, we jump on our ship, we, we go to Kuwait, from Kuwait we get off the ships, we get into our gun trucks, and we drive three days to the city of Fallujah. Back in 2004, the city of Fallujah was the most dangerous place you could possibly be in the world. Uh, for statistically speaking, I think I read that somewhere. And so, but here we were, we were, we were young and we were, we were in the midst of it. Um, right away, we, we started getting watered, so it was just a big reality check right away. So, we're, we start combat operations, we get going, and I don't know if you guys remember back in 2004, uh, there was a big battle in, around the city of Fallujah. So basically we just surrounded the whole city, a lot of uh, infantry battalions, and we just went front to back. So it's like late October, um, I had a, a little machine gun I was issued, it was an M249 squad automatic weapon, and the snipers liked me to hang out with them because I had that little gun. So I wasn't the, the first unit to push in, I was just outside of it, we're on patrol, and um, so, we're, we're walking, we're doing our thing, it's kind of late, it's like 10 o'clock at night or something like that. And it's, it's game time, you know, so our staff sergeant says, hey, take a knee, it's about to begin. And so we do a 360, here we go. I have night vision goggles on, so I kind of pull them up because I wanted to see the, the thing. And so he's behind me, so I hear the radio and here, three, two, one, cacao. Probably the most violent uh, explosion I've ever heard in my whole entire life. Um, literally the ground shook underneath us and I kind of, we all stand up in awe and I'm like, man, I, it, just, it just hit me, you know, a chill goes up my spine and I'm just like, what the did I get myself into? Um, you know, I'm from the country again, I'm from, I'm, I'm from Calusa County, you know, and, and here I am and from that moment on, it was nothing but machine gun fire, Apache helicopters. I mean, from that moment on, it's just constant through for the next couple of months, really. So, I promise I'm going to the tradition things, you know, we're just kind of setting the stage here. So, um, a Marine Corps battalion is about a thousand Marines, give or take. Uh, on this particular uh, uh, deployment for us, we lost about 50 Marines, which is, which is quite a bit. Uh, two really good friends of mine didn't make it home, but somehow, some way, I got home and I was physically unharmed. I didn't earn a Purple Heart, luckily. So we come home, we go back to Afghanistan, we come home, and we didn't have enough time to do another deployment, and I didn't want to re-enlist. I wanted to come home and, and start my life. And so the Marine Corps thought that the best thing that they could do for us was to make us push lawnmowers that time. And I was devastated. You know, for me, um, you know, in our unit, we, we, because we had done a lot of this, this fighting and, and, and our deployments, we had a lot of ribbons, you know, so when we wear our dress blues on the Marine Corps birthday, you know, we, had, we, we were kind of decorated. And so we took a lot of pride in this. And so for them to, to do that to us, I remember sitting in my barracks room and I'm just like, how could you do this to me? I gave you everything. And so we're, we get back and when I got out of the Marine Corps, I didn't want to talk about the Marine Corps. I wanted to grow my hair long. I, wanted to, to, I ran around Amsterdam for about a month. You know, um, I didn't want to think about it. I wanted to just push it deep down inside of me. So kind of fast forward, I had, I had already started Fitzum. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing, I'm moving forward. I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of moving forward in my life. And I catch wind of an organization called the American Dream U. American Dream U is a, a veteran entrepreneurship organization put on by this guy named Phil, awesome thing. 
kind of transitioning veterans out um, and, and, and hopefully into entrepreneurship. It was, it was great. I got to meet Tim Ferriss, a bunch of great speakers out there, Greg McCohen. And, um, so the speaker comes out there, his name is Brian Jennings. And he talks about, he's uh, the long snapper for the San Francisco 49ers. Um, he gives this amazing talk about the day he got cut from the San Francisco 49ers. So I'm gonna paraphrase here and kind of try to tell you a little bit about what he said, but it was something along the lines of, in that moment, I wanted to rip Jim Harbaugh apart. I was so devastated that he was taking away this thing that I loved so much. And he's talking about you know, playing in the NFL. And he says, but as I walked to the car, it, I knew that it was a race to being grateful, that I had to be grateful for the time, and again, this is him talking, he says, I knew I had, I had to be grateful for the time that I spent. I've played on the, on the highest levels of professional sports. I've, uh, I've played with Joe Montana, Steve Young, and all these legends and, and Super Bowls in front of thousands of people. And as those words were leaving his mouth and, and hitting my eardrum, it kind of hits me. I'm just like, man, the Marine Corps, the time that I did spend there, the, the 243 years of, of war fighting, from this organization, the, the Eagle Globe and the symbology of the Eagle Globe and Anchor, the, the traditions that we held there from the Marine Corps birthday, the cutting of the cake with the NCO sword, all these wonderful things, while shoving all the pain that I had built up, I was also shoving all these wonderful things that I had learned, leadership. I mean, truly leading men in combat was, was a big deal. And that was a big turning point in my life. Um, that wasn't that long ago, it was maybe, maybe four years ago, three years ago, and that's when things really started to kind of move full circle for me. So, you know, I've, as I got here today, and I, and I was just like, man, it's Christmas, I'm giving this talk about the Marine Corps, but, but you know, I had already developed it, so I, you know, it's Christmas, I didn't want to kind of bring this, this, this darker story, but I did want to give a gift to the audience, and for me, because it is Christmas, you know, so I wanted, the biggest, biggest thing that I could give you guys was that lesson, that on this road that we're on, whether it be a creative professional, entrepreneur, or just life, there's gonna be some big bumps. And maybe, just maybe, those big bumps are the ones that really hold the lessons to our overall success, and maybe just the finest at the end. So that's my story, and thank you very much.